military exhibit was originally built by a crew of volunteers led by Camp Adair soldier John Pfaff. Many of the exhibit's original artifacts were donated by American Legion members, and the Legion continues to support us today. As you can imagine, updating an exhibit takes time and money. Time is always an issue since the museum is staffed by only two part-time employees, and there's always a lot of work to be done. As such, we rely heavily on interns from Western Oregon University and volunteers from the community to help manage the workload. One such volunteer is Independence resident Amy Christensen. A few months ago, Amy and her husband Nathan, a member of the Army National Guard, toured the military exhibit. Both saw room for improvement. Shortly thereafter, Amy came up with a plan to update and expand the exhibit. It was an ambitious project, but as you can see, she did an exceptional job. Nathan helped as well. He is the artist behind the exhibit's panels and slideshow presentation, and he's done a lot of heavy lifting along the way. My husband Darren chipped in too, as did members and spouses of members of the Heritage Museum Society and the Museum Commission. It was truly a community effort. I could go on and on about Amy's talents and the fact that her energy, enthusiasm, and vision fueled this entire effort, but I think it better if I let her tell you about the exhibit and introduce our very special guest tonight. Please welcome Amy Christensen. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to who I am, because we're fairly new to the area. Um, my husband and I moved to Independence with our family two years ago, and we bought a house down here in the historic district, and we just fell in love with this town. Um, I have a degree in anthropology from Oregon State, and my husband has one in history. Um, and he is an officer in the Oregon National Guard. Um, we both have a love of museums. When we travel, that's what we always like to do. So when we moved into our home and I took my daughter for a walk and we passed by a museum, I was filled with excitement. <laughs> I came in the front doors and knew that this would be a part of my life. So um, I came up with this idea with my husband as we walked through the exhibit that if I, I wanted to help expand and update a part of the museum. And if I'm gonna do that, I better start with the military exhibit because that will have personal meaning to us and make it fun. So um, I came to Shannon with uh, probably, I had a, one of those legal yellow pads and I think I had three sheets filled out line by line with different ideas of this doesn't have a label and this doesn't apply to our area and just kind of, I don't know, maybe being a little bit too full of ourselves with all these ideas we had. But she said that she liked the ideas, got approval from Peggy, we took it to the board and got the ball rolling. So um, with staff and board approval, we got underway and we came up with um, a couple of goals. So he, these were the um, goals that we defined for this project. More clearly illustrate to patrons the impact of military operations on our local area, specifically. Pay tribute to our community members' military service, increase museum visibility in the community, and demonstrate the museum's ability to enhance and update our collection. So with a combined effort, as Shannon mentioned, of about 175 hours, late nights alone in a dark museum with the spirits, <laughs> um, noses in our computer screens in the, at all hours of the night researching the lives of past veterans and knocking on people's doors that I'd never met hoping that they would be willing to help me. Um, phone interviews with people whom I've now come to admire very much and maybe a naive confidence in my, that my vision was good and worthwhile. So um, I've enjoyed getting to know new members of the community. Um, I've, I've come to know city councilors, librarians, museum board members, Lions Club members, and so on. So I couldn't imagine a better way for our family to dive into the community and, and become a part of independence. <clears throat> I've built lasting friendships with the staff here and volunteers. But by far the best part of this process has been shaking hands with local veterans and being able to tell them thank you. And thank you from a military spouse and from someone that really wants to honor and respect all that you have done and contributed to your nation. This exhibit has been designed with the idea that it can be rotated so we can tell new stories 
um, as often as we decide to go through and, and update. And the slideshow can also be updated frequently. So when, um, as you take a look at the exhibit, if you see maybe a family member or a friend whose story may be missing, please let us know because we will, we will update it um, as we get that information. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce to you our keynote speaker is a man that I've come to get to know and admire very much over, over the process of this project. Um, he's an independence resident and an author and collaborator of over 20 books. He's contributed to documentaries, um, and he's some several of his books are New York Times bestsellers. My husband knew who he was by name as soon as I mentioned him, <laughs> um, and just a really amazing guy. So please welcome John Bruning. Good evening. Before I get started, if you have not seen the display yet, uh, there's a beautiful. <sighs> Tribute to Taylor Marks, who was our central grad who was killed in Iraq in 2009. And prior to Taylor going and joining the Oregon National Guard, he was one of the original members of the 973rd Civilians on the Battlefield. There's a little bit of information about the 973rd. It was a group entirely of civilians that I founded um, with Taylor and a couple other uh, individuals from the town um, to support uh, Oregon National Guard training operations. Uh, so we were their bad guys. And in the course of, uh, of about eight months, Taylor learned to love being around the infantry. And he ended up turning down a scholarship to the University of Oregon to go join the Oregon National Guard and serve in time of war. But, and I'm going to embarrass him, one of our other original members is here tonight, and that is Aaron Allen, standing in back. Aaron, can you wave? Aaron, Aaron is a graduate of Central High School. He graduated a few years before uh, Taylor did. And uh, after uh, his time uh, with us in the 973rd, uh, Aaron joined the Army. He went big Army instead of National Guard and served in Afghanistan in 2011 and 2012. Is that right, Aaron? In Helmand Province as a forward observer. And I remember I had just gotten home, and Aaron had come home on leave a couple months later, and we sat over at Rookie's kind of comparing notes, and um, I had felt like I had uh, found my brother again. <laughs> so thanks, Aaron, for being here. I'm going to be completely emotional through this. You'll just have to bear with me. Um, Taylor was one of the kids that I had pulled into the 973rd, who was also one of my wife's favorite students and was really an exceptional per person. And I'll be talking about him in detail in a minute after I pull myself together. But uh, I do want to say thank you. It's an honor to be here this evening. Um, as I prepared for this speech, it dawned on me that this is the first time I have spoken at a community event here in town since I came back from Afghanistan in 2010. Now, my daughter, who is a Willamette Bearcat and a four-point student, is back there with a number of her friends. I'm very grateful that you all made it. Every time I say something like, I came back, this hasn't happened since I came back from Afghanistan, I get an eye roll from the kids now. <laughs> and I'm wondering, I'm wearing my reading glasses now, so I can't tell if you rolled your eyes or not, Crick. But, um, but the veterans in the audience, know that each deployment and each trip overseas is a dividing line in life. And each time you go overseas and return, you must find your own new sense of normalcy as you return a different person to a world and place that hasn't really changed and has no concept of what you've seen or experienced. The disconnect there imperils a lot of veterans and their families. It is disorienting, it is alienating, and at times the simplicity of service overseas, along with the sense of purpose and sometimes the adrenaline rush, makes those who survived combat wish to return to it. 
that probably is one of the least understood aspects of military service by those of us here at home who have never worn the, our nation's flag on our shoulders. Why would you go back? I had that conversation with a member of the Georgia National Guard while I was in Afghanistan. He was on his third tour consecutively. And when I asked him, why are you here? I mean, you've done your part. Uh, he'd, been, he'd been in the same base for almost four years. Well, it turns out he was hiding from a lawsuit back home. <laughs> so he was probably not a, a, a good case study there. But. Others have told me that there is meaning in service. You are part of something much greater than the narrow scope of a single life. You go out wanting to protect those we love at home and bring peace and prosperity to those suffering overseas and have no defender. And all the time I've been around the military and I've been doing this now for, since 1991, I can't even count that high. Um, that's why I married a math major. Uh, in all the time I've been around the military, I've never met anyone who joined to kill people or harm people. Even the snipers I interviewed for a book called Shock Factor that I co-wrote with a Marine sniper, they all told me, told me they had no desire to take lives. They were there hiding in buildings or rooftops to protect the soldiers on patrol around them. They saw themselves not as life takers, but protectors. So the fathers and mothers and children back home would not hear the doorbell ring and find the contact team waiting on their front porch. We regret to inform you that your son has been killed in action. OK, um, fair warning. Uh, over the last years, I've become a little jaded and cynical after what I've written about and experienced. I have a hard time listening to um, some of the speeches I hear on Memorial Day and Veterans Day that offer little more than platitudes. I mean, how many times do we hear the word sacrifice on those days? It is so overused, it has lost its power, and it's lost its meaning. And I really, frankly, can't stand to hear it anymore. So you won't hear it in this speech, not after the things that I've seen, the people that I've come to love who have worn the uniform, and after knowing the depth of loss and the courage required just to sign your name on the enlistment papers. Those words, sacrifice, just seem like, like box checking. And I walk away from those moments when I hear those speeches thinking the men and women I have known deserve more. So tonight, this is my version of more. Take, take it as you will. I mean, obviously, I don't hold the monopoly on the truth. I am a 50-year-old civilian now trying to understand and make sense of the dedication and cost that is required when you serve our country. In graduate school years and years ago, I spent a year studying the Whitaker neighborhood in West Eugene and what happened to the families in a three block area there during World War II. These were middle class and upper middle class, very successful families who had found a way to thrive in the depths of the depression. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, the boys and girls in that neighborhood flocked to enlist. Most ended up in the Army Air Force, actually, but some also joined the Navy or fought with the Army as infantrymen. One served alongside Bob Dole in the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, one of the girls uh, became a Navy clerk. And in San Diego, she was responsible for checking in all the captured aircraft that were coming in from the Pacific. And she got to meet Charles Lindbergh as he came to fly one of those aircraft one day. Another one became an Army nurse. These kids from Eugene were all friends before the war. The boys roamed the Cascades together. They hunted and fished and camped and ice climbed. They called themselves the Pack Rats, and they all went to Eugene High School. They ended up in combat on every, in every theater on land, air, and sea. And in 1943, they started to die. The first one died in a training accident stateside. And then Aaron Cutterback was the first combat casualty. He was a B-17 pilot who was shot down during a mission over Germany. He crash landed in the North Sea and froze to death before help could reach him. The first tensions built in the neighborhood after that, after Aaron's death, the sense of loss and grief drove those who were closest to him and still in town 
to wonder if others in the hood were doing enough to support the war effort. The boys who were deemed slackers were ruthlessly mistreated. One, who had been initially disqualified, what they called 4 uh, for military service as a result of a physical ailment, would go out in civilian clothes and people would spit on him. He later talked his way into the Navy and he was killed off Iwo Jima in February of 1945 when a kamikaze hit his ship. Others died or came home wounded. The neighborhood once filled with barbecues and friendly families happily sharing over fences grew pain racked and quiet. One son of the neighborhood, Gerald Johnson, became a national hero and Oregon's top ace of World War II. In a storm off Japan, a month after the war ended, only a few days before he was supposed to come home, he gave up his parachute to a passenger in his aircraft who had failed to bring his own aboard. The passenger survived and Gerald went in with his plane. The war transformed the social fabric of that little community within a community. Friendships were severed by loss. They were redrawn by experience and trauma and depth and of dedication to the war effort. There was no aspect of life left unchanged in this little corner of Oregon that had never experienced a bombing raid, never had seen its buildings destroyed by artillery fire. But the old neighborhood was gone, just as effectively as a carpet bombing raid. In the post-war years, it was rebuilt, and the new social fabric that took shape was weaved together around the sense of loss. But that void remained in those families who were there during the war and before. It never left them. And when I interviewed them in the 90s, it was a, a still a painful point of their lives. I wrote about this in a school paper, and I guess I understood it logically, but I certainly did not understand it emotionally until Taylor was killed. Taylor was a 2008 graduate of Central High School. He was, he was brilliant. He really was. He was so smart. And he was also puckish. I love that term because it fits. It's a Shakespeare, like Shakespeare reference from Puck, the character. Um, basically a kid who loved mischief. He would sneak into abandoned buildings just to explore them. When he babysat my kids, he taught them how to use a magnifying lens to burn ants. But, puckishness aside, he was a doer. He was somebody with the intellectual horsepower to think creatively and the practical acumen to execute on new ideas. He built things and made them work. And I met him in a ballroom dance class at Central High School. And one day I looked at him. He was the only one of all the boys. He was totally into it. All the other boys were just like, I don't want to touch anybody. I don't want to do this. It wasn't cool, you know? But Taylor's like, yeah, I'm all about it. Let's go. So I thought, you know, maybe he'd be a good fit with the 973rd. So I asked him, how do you feel about getting the crap beaten out of you in bad weather, hour after hour, by infantry? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I took him out on a test drive. We went down. We actually supported two infantry companies that first weekend in January of 2008. And here's Taylor in the snow and slush of the shoot house, which has no roof, at the Goshen State Police Range, getting slammed into walls, zip cuffed, dragged through blackberry bushes, told to resist detention so he'd be struggling and fighting to, uh, to get away from the Oregon Guard. And uh, of course, they'd just slam him and put a boot on his head. This is what we do, we, we actually love it. Um, and, uh, and every iteration, he'd pop back up. He was completely unprepared for the elements. He was wearing clothing that just got soaking wet. He was shivering. It was about 28 degrees. And we went straight from the state police range up to Goshen to support another infantry company where we were laying uh, ambushes in the snow until 3 in the morning. We wrapped that up and immediately headed back down to Goshen to complete the, the weekend with, uh, uh, with Alpha Company, two of the 162 infantry. So Taylor's initiation to what we do was 37 hours of abuse. And when we were done, he looked at me and said, 
when do we get to do this again? <laughs> like, okay, you will definitely fit in with our crew. Well, when Iraqi insurgents killed him on a bridge in Baghdad in August of 2009, they not only took somebody that was like a son to me, they took a life full of promise. I raged at what had happened. He was more than an armored vehicle driver. This was a soul whose destiny was, was greater. The lost potential at what he could have contributed to our society left me awake at night for years. And just as had happened in the Whitaker neighborhood in World War II, the social fabric around me here in Independence began to change. Actually, it had been changing all around me and I hadn't really even noticed since 2001 as men and women from our community went off to war. A big shift took place in 0405 when the Oregon Guard served in Iraq. There's some photos on the wall there of some of our local guys, including Spike Olson. Some of you may know Mandy Olson, the former teacher at Independence Elementary School. Since then, people from our town have had boots on the ground all over the planet. They come home, and most of the time, we here do not even know it. We're so disconnected from this global war that those who fight it are barely noticed. And yet the effects of the war are felt by all of us, whether or not we recognize it. One of my wife's other favorite students was a kid named Dawson Officer. And Dawson was one of those smart aleck types who always had a joke. And after he left, he, was, he wanted to be a police officer. And Dawson was, was going to be officer, officer. So that was so catch-22, I had to give him grief about that every time I saw him in, in her class after school. Well, Dawson ended up working at US Bank over in Monmouth. And one day, he vanished. I, I just figured he went on to school or got a job with the police department someplace. Well, flash forward a year, and I'm standing on the runway <laughs> at McCord Air Force Base, taking photos of two of the 162 infantry, our local Oregon National Guard Infantry Battalion, as they're returning home from this very, very difficult deployment that saw 77 out of the 700 killed or wounded in action, nine dead and the rest wounded. And I'm taking photos and a shadow crosses my camera. And I look up and there's Dawson staring at me. And he goes, hi, John, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I burst into tears, being the completely unemotional person that I am. And uh, I gave him this huge hug. And I said, I didn't even know you were overseas. I didn't even know you were in the military. And I didn't even know you went to war. And that was the reason why I wrote the book, The Devil's Sandbox. After that happened, I thought, you know what? This is a disconnect, at least for me personally, I need to solve. And uh, Dawson went on to found Four Spirits Distillery. So if you ever see his whiskey or rum or vodka that's uh, in the local liquor stores, it's great stuff. And when I write my books, I'm drinking his hooch. <laughs> Noticed or not, the fabric of our community is being reshaped by this conflict. I saw it happen within Taylor's circle of friends. It tore relationships apart. It created new ones. Those who loved him bonded in ways nobody can understand. Eight of us ended up in combat after his death, including Aaron. We all came home with what has been called our soul loss moment where events overseas transformed us from the person known and loved by those we left behind here to the person we became when we returned. Often that person proved incompatible with those we loved. Divorce rates in the line units that have been serving overseas has soared. And in some that I've written about, the divorce rate is over 90%. In 2014, I set off on a cross-country research trip. I just got in the GTO and rolled east. I've crossed the country four times by car since then, staying mainly to the back roads in small towns just to see America. I've stopped at countless war memorials, seen the names of the dead from the small counties from South Dakota to Tennessee. I do this by myself because I don't really uh, think anybody in my family would be cool with 
the constant historical detours and stops that I take along the way. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that stops at every war memorial I see. And in Phelps County, Nebraska, I came across one of the most striking. It's called uh, Field of Blue. And it's a bronze statue of a little boy clinging to a folded flag. The moment represents losing a mother or a father who wore the uniform. But it also represents a greater truth. Sometimes the cost of service is generational. After Gerald Johnson, Oregon's top fighter ace, died in that plane crash, his family struggled for decades. His widow remarried badly, and the husband never could get out of the shadow cast by the hero who came before him. Gerald's twin brother, Harold, blamed himself for the death of his brother. He killed himself in 1975 after a long struggle with that guilt. And two weeks later, Gerald's father died of a heart attack, brought on by the stress of losing his other son. Gerald's son, Jerry, didn't know he was even related to his hero father until he found out by accident as a teenager. The effect on the family dynamics was considerable. And the truth is, I've heard stories like this from countless veterans' families. In the course of the 26 or 27 years I've been doing this, I think I've interviewed about 2,300 veterans. And the truth is, at times, the economic and social changes that affect a family with a combat loss are dramatic. In one case, and this is something I learned while I was on my last cross-country trip, the grandson of a national hero fighter pilot who was killed in 1944 told me that after his granddad died, his family went from being part of the Texas political upper class to struggling to make ends meet. His grandmother never got over the loss of the love of her life. She married and divorced six times, turned into abusive relationships, and killed two of her husbands in self-defense. All three of their sons died in plane crashes, and she died a shattered alcoholic 44 years after her love's death in New Guinea. After she died, the family went into the house and found his Medal of Honor hanging in her living room. His grandson said to me last summer, I wonder how my life would have turned out if he hadn't died. These are some of the hidden consequences of service. They are not discussed. They are rarely studied because they are so intimate and family-centric. Hollywood has tried, but they usually only portray veterans as victims of war and not warriors. And the mindset is very different. And for these men and women I know, being cast as a victim to buttress a political agenda of any form is supremely offensive and dishonors all they endured to help keep us free. So I speak of these effects today not to diminish service, but to highlight the consequences. For by doing so, the true depth and nature of the courage and the devotion required to defend our country can truly be understood. I know I didn't get that until years and years into my professional career. Across America, in every town, no matter the size, these kinds of after effects of wearing the uniform are real. War reshapes who we are, who we love, and who we become. Service to our nation in time of war is not for the faint of heart. It requires courage and conviction that the cause is worth the personal price and the price it exacts on our families and friends. It is a price that is often paid by generations who know nothing of the war that dislocated their own lives. So joining the military in time of war is not a job. It is not a means to get a college education. The closest I can compare it to is a monastic calling. You have to want to be there. You have to want to stand on those distant ramparts, knowing that even as you do, the fire of battle will forge a new person within you. Now, I know I've focused a lot on the harshest and the most personal effects of service, but most often, new does not mean bad or damaged. Those who serve frequently come back stronger emotionally, more proud, and filled with confidence that they do have the wherewithal to achieve and succeed here at home for those they love. Service pushes you. You find out the true measure of your heart and what you are capable of doing. You learn the core strength of love the ephemeral nature of life, and the validity of sucking the marrow out of every moment because you don't know how many moments 
there will be. You grow and you find an inner power that centers you. Every crisis here at home seems manageable. After all, it isn't as tough as combat, right? For me, I came home knowing I measured up. I'd been bullied as a kid repeatedly for years and years and years, and I never fought back. And I always thought I was a coward. Now, I'm definitely no hero, and I'm definitely not very courageous, but I do know that I went out on patrols. I was with the guys wherever they went. I'd follow them anywhere. And I wear that with pride now. I used to wear my heart on my sleeve. All my life I did that. I came home from Afghanistan far more protective of it, far more withdrawn. I used to be outgoing and personable, an extrovert. Now I am actually the most comfortable with a few loved ones and my dysfunctional Jordanian dog in the Oregon woods. The introvert I became, frankly, recoils at public speaking, where I once used to love it. Anything here at home I knew I could tackle, and I needed that strength for in the years after my last patrol. We went through marriage trouble. My family endured cancer and brain surgery, and all of that was cake compared to getting shot at. Our veterans came home and become Sorry, our veterans come home becoming new people reformed by their experiences. That change always has a ripple effect and imagine that that ripple starts with one couple in their kitchen. It flows out to the other members of their family and from their house, those ripples flow into other relationships and into the community. There are hundreds here rippling through our daily lives, changing us in ways we will not understand until years of hindsight give us distance and perspective. Now imagine this happening in every community, in every state. And just as those who serve return changed from their time in uniform, so too will our nation be changed by this experience of war. This is why this museum display that we are here to celebrate today is so vital to understanding ourselves. This is the American experience in microcosm, in an intimate and personal form that we can all relate to in some way. The Independence Museum has captured snapshots of who we were and how we have changed as a community through our experiences at home and in combat overseas. It is an exhibit that celebrates service but hints at the greater transformations that shape our time, our friendships, and our families. I hope that after you've seen the exhibit, we can all walk away with a sense of respect for those who cared so much for our country and its well-being that they imperiled their own well-being and their families to serve in America's name. Politics may divide us, we may bitterly contest the validity and need for a war, but the one thing that we must unite behind is respect and gratitude for those willing to live up to their convictions and place themselves in harm's way. That respect does not just extend to a thank you for your service and maybe paying a bar tab. Respect includes the effort to understand and contextualize the struggles and evolutions our veterans experience as they return home, not to the normalcy of their past lives, but to the reality that they must create their own new sense of normal. Ultimately, that new normal will become part of our social fabric and our communal experience. That is the true power of war. It reaches well beyond the battlefield to anonymous havens like Independence, Oregon. And we are all being changed by its reach. It is, up to it is up to us to determine whether or not that change leads us to a path of greater wisdom, insight, and empathy. We owe that to our veterans as citizens and voters, so that at very least, when we do send our men and women into battle in the future, we are certain the cause matches the measure of their devotion and courage, and the cost combat will exact on all who love them. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that you turned out tonight. It's nice to see a, a big crowd here. Uh, I did have a few notes. And <clears throat> just quickly in passing, my father was in the United States Navy. 
and he had a brother who joined the army first. Actually, he was drafted. And so I was just a little kid, and I had a little brother. And so Dad went off to the Navy, and his brother, Bob, went off to the Army. Bob was assigned to General Patton's tank division after being a truck driver. And uh, <clears throat> my dad was stationed in Pearl Harbor, but it was after the bombing. But he said, Dennis, I was there for the duration of the war. Didn't matter if the war was over. He said, we had cleanup, we had lots of problems. And he said, we were able to repair some ships. He said, but Pearl Harbor was, was kind of a nice place after it had been bombed. He said, we didn't really worry about being bombed again. They, if the Japanese had known how successful they were, he said they could have invaded. We didn't have, we were all scrambled. But <clears throat> it affected me because my dad turned into a different person. The war changed him. They didn't know about uh, stress syndrome or things like that. So when dad came home from the war, he was not easy to live with. He was short tempered. And finally, my mother divorced him. So my brother Dave and I, we, we kind of, it was awkward because he didn't come home at all. He just stayed away. We wanted to see him. And so I was talking to dad when he was close to dying. And suddenly he starts yelling out World War II stuff, like he's still in the Navy. And he's saying, get that ship out of here. He was a ship fitter, so he welded. Any ship that came in to Pearl Harbor, he would fix with a whole team of other guys. And he said, you're on until it's done, so you can get that ship out of here back in the war. It affected him his whole lifetime. And even the night that just before he died, I stayed with him that night. And several times he would break into wartime talk. And I'd heard it before, but he was living it, breathing hard, yelling out these directions to people. And that's how it effect, affected him and David and me. I, it's just, it's there. And uh, he never said bad things about the Navy. He said they, they treated us well. You got plenty to eat. And he said you got pulled in if you did something wrong, but he said they wanted you to do the job right the next time. And then his brother, Bob, drove a tank for General Patton. And he, he was the one who became the alcoholic. But before he became an alcoholic, he also told about Patton. And he said, the man was hard to enjoy, but he won battles. So you didn't mind being out there because Patton was calling the rules. And uh, he didn't understand <laughs> defeat. And he said, he let you know that. Now, I never quirted anybody with the famous little quirt he'd keep under his arm. Didn't quirt Bob, at least. But Bob had a different perception of the war. And that lasted him a lifetime. And his life came a little bit short because of alcoholism. And that's how it affects some people. But I'm better for knowing them and knowing about what they went through. Now I'm going to switch gears quickly and talk about the museum quickly. I was able to be a member of this museum board about 40 years ago. We were a new little company and, and uh, eager to start. And I was invited by one of the board members. His name was Philip Darling, lived here a long time. And then I met him through one of his children. And uh, he moved away. I haven't seen him since. But he had such good things to say about the museum board. And I thought, wow, I'm going to be here. And I have watched this museum grow to what it is today. When we opened, July 4th, uh, 1976, I believe, some of us had to bring our own stuff from home to have displays. People didn't think we were going to make it. This, this was huge. And all we had was just some displays to put out because people didn't have confidence to give us stuff to put out. But that soon changed. 
and we have been a healthy part of this town and its history. We are a depository for old, in interesting antiques. It's fun to be in here in this museum, to listen to children, look at the displays, and then after I've given them a tour, or somebody gives them the tour, they come in on a Saturday, and you can hear them talking to their folks, and this is what this is. And they're telling the same thing that they've heard from those of us who are curators, and it's fun. So come in other times to the museum. We have lots of things going on, and I'm going to put this away, and thank you for my time. Having this exhibit open on Veterans Day, it is, it's just the right day to do it. It's the day that the nation in general takes a moment and stands and appreciates the, the service that some of the men and women have put forth to, to preserving some of our, our freedoms and liberties. And so what better day to do it than on Veterans Day? I think that this exhibit is important for our community because of Western Oregon University's long history working with military students. I think that it's important that this exhibit is so close to Western Oregon University because it gives students an opportunity to come over and appreciate some of the military history that's here presented. It also gives some of the staff and faculty an opportunity to integrate a little bit with some of the stuff that maybe they traditionally wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. So I'm really proud of what we're doing here.